You're kicking it with G on your favorite station. The perfect station. 92 KELZ, the only station with new music, new artists, new sound. We have a special guest in the building, Dr. Sonia Sloan. How you doing? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing great. Yes. I was really looking forward to this interview. Yes. Because I've been trying to get a health professional in here to really talk about some stuff. All right. That know what they're doing and know the background and the history. Okay. So for some of my listeners that really don't know about you, can you give us a brief background? Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, Dr. Sonia Sloan. I'm an orthopedic surgeon by trade. Um, the first African-American female at Baylor College of Medicine in orthopedic surgery. Um, went to Texas Tech undergrad, chemistry major, and then UTMB Galveston here. You know, so I'm a Texas girl. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also the uh, first lady of the Luke Church up on the north side. My husband is Dr. Timothy Sloan. And we got three fabulous kids. That's what I was talking about, man. They've been running me around today. So you a doctor, <laughs> the first lady. And a mama, yes. And <laughs> how do you do it? And you know, you got to have a good group of people that are around you that help and support. It's a team. You know, it's a team effort. I'm glad I'm glad somebody said it because yeah. I'm sorry people like, I've been doing it all on my own. Uh, ain't no way you no, can do all this you stuff on to, your own. You how it is out here today? Yeah, family's great, but you know, our fam's not close. Mm -hmm. So church fam has taken over that. Some of the organizations I'm in has taken over that. And then, you know, just helping other friends out that are mm -hmm. in our same predicaments. Mm -hmm. So before you really got into medicine, what was your path? Um, I really, I mean, I've always liked medicine, but mm -hmm. I was a chemistry major mm -hmm. and I uh, was going to take up a job up in New Jersey while I was dating my husband in Princeton and uh, went in and told my parents, you know, I was going to ease it on them. They're like, you know, let's, let's go to a coffee house and talk about mm -hmm. this. And they're like, we don't have any coffee house in Denison, Texas, Sherman, Texas, North Texas, very small <laughs> town. I was like, she's like, there's Denny's, there's an IHOP, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And I'm like, well, maybe we should open one. So that was my first entrepreneurial adventure and uh, opened up my first business at age 23. Yeah. And what type of business was that? It was called Not Just Coffee. And Not we did coffee beans, teas, pastries. It was like a place that you know had jazz on Sunday night. Um, there was a junior college in Austin College. Kids would come and hang out. So it was that kind of place. So was it just not fulfilling? You was like, this is just not what I wanted. to do. No, I got waitlisted for medical school. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was planning on going to medical school and got waitlisted. Mm -hmm. I always say, God has a plan. You know, if you want to hear him laugh, you, you try to do your plan and something else will happen. I, I will find that hard to, like, just hard to grasp. Just to be on the waitlist and then some pops off and kicks off. It's going great. And for me to stop this. Mm-hmm. To yeah. change up, I'm like, I don't know. God. And essentially, that was it. It was more of like, let me let me venture over here, see what happens. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it was like, okay, I got into medical school now. Let's let's go. Mm -hmm. So I sold the business to my parents, and they sold it maybe two years before Starbucks moved into Texas. Oh, wow. Yep. That's, that's Perfect crazy. timing. That's you know? amazing. Perfect yeah. timing. Perfect timing. So you left there. you on your medical journey. Now you're orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. How is that being in a male-dominated area? Man. Because I used to be a surgical technician. So you already going, know. Like You know. You know. <laughs> there, I, I got there and realizing going into surgery, uh, it was not because people were supporting. It was mm -hmm. almost like they were pushing back, saying, you know, there's not a lot of women in surgery. It's not uh, family-friendly. Um, and orthopedic surgery is not a women's field. You don't want to be there. It's a boys' club. And it's one of those things of, why can't I be here? You know, why can I not? So if you tell me no, that's what I'm going to try to do, you mm -hmm. know. And, um, again, God will open some doors and close some windows just for you, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so that's pretty much what happened. I walked into orthopedics not as the standard planned uh, direction, but because that's what I prayed for See, and wanted. And it's like a woman's touch. You came mm -hmm. in, was nothing. You come in, and now you're orthopedic surgeon. Now she's like, oh, she putting her own touches on. We're going to start losing people. <laughs> people going to start going <laughs> over here. Like, I know the pressure was going on for yes. you being there. Yeah. That I, it was not always welcome. You mm -hmm. know, I was not welcome. You had a different group. And Baylor College of Medicine was good. And since I've had a good support group, there were a lot of men that were in my corner that supported me. Um, there were a lot of men that told me to leave and go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of men that were racist and sexist and uh, definitely would, you know, yes. make it very, very difficult, uh, almost a harassing, bullying kind of situation coming in. Mm -hmm. um, but those were the fewer number. Mm -hmm. you know? So that was a good thing. At least I knew how to keep going. And I'm definitely a fighter. You know, I'm a fighter. And like, I didn't get there just by chance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So why ortho? Um, I, I was a gymnast mm -hmm. and a competitive gymnastics and a cheerleading and mm -hmm. hurdler. And I hurt my knee going towards regionals, Texas regional hurdles, mm -hmm. 100 hurdles. 
and tore up my knee, basically. Subluxed it and was going in for knee scope. My mom's a nurse. I grew up seeing, you know, hospital, that situation. And uh, she, she, you know, hung out with this orthopedic surgeon. He was pretty cool. And mm. he was very nice to a black young girl where Denison, Texas had no th- black doctors and no black female doctors and definitely not a surgeon. Mm. So, but he was, he has sort of said, you know, you know, why not this? You could, you could do this totally, you know? So he was probably the first, Dr. Black was his name. Mm. Amazing, right? right. right <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So. That's crazy. Like, I just, every time I hear it, I automatically think general surgery or plastics or something like that would deal with more females when I f- heard that she was orthodox, I was like, oh man, yeah. she has to really know what like going on, all the banging and picking people up and stuff that goes yeah. on dealing with that. Like, yeah. it's pretty crazy. Yeah. So, back to your practice. So, when did you open up your practice here? So I, I came out um, of Baylor and was going to stay West Texas, mm-hmm. you know, out um, uh, out towards Katy. And um, to be honest, it was almost blackballed. You know, it was one mm. of those of you're going to start up and we're going to make it hard for you. Uh, I got pregnant, and we had been trying to get pregnant. And after four years of college, four years of medical school, a year of general surgery, a year of research, five years of ortho, 14 years later, I needed a break, you know. Mm-hmm. And so in getting pregnant and knowing um, that was going to be a transitional moment for me, I took off. I just took some time off. Uh, and in that interim, bills didn't stop. So it was like, what else can I do, mm-hmm. you know. So um, I picked up this thing called locum tenens, and locum tenens is basically a traveling physician. Um, and in ortho, it's a no-no. It's a taboo. It's a you don't do it that way kind mm-hmm. of thing. I didn't realize I was on the cutting edge. You know, I should have known that just because I've been that trendsetter. But that was a door in to a great lifestyle. And so locum tenens is a traveling orthopedic surgeon. I contract where I want to go, mm-hmm. when I want to go, how long I'm going to be there. Uh, and basically, I operate. I do clinic. Why is that? Like, why is it such a thing for you not to be a traveling ortho? You gotta, you gotta see that how history and medicine has been very, very traditional. Just the fact that there wasn't a black female orthopedic surgeon at Baylor College of Medicine, one of the top ten, mm-hmm. until two thousand six, and then this year is the first year they've actually had the first neurosurgeon black female. I just think, just yeah, right mm-hmm. yeah, Dr. Simpson. So that is that is phenomenal that we're still living in that era where we're still having first. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? That that's sort of crazy, but it is what it is, and so therefore. Tradition in medicine is still old school and locked down. It's slowly, mm-hmm. slowly changing as far as diversity and that push. We're at that era of diversity changing. Diversity doesn't always mean just black, though. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's women. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. men that are from other countries. So diversity doesn't always mean, you know, us. Mm-hmm. But um, that change has been slow, slow, slow. And so anything that is not the norm for medicine is considered abnormal or a taboo. Uh, and locum tenens wasn't that. You were supposed to finish, graduate, and hang a shingle and work there for the next you know, 30, 30 years of your mm-hmm. life. You know, exactly. Yeah. That's 30-year mortgage. That's where we got it from, right? Mm. Um, but it's uh, one of those things like if you change and you do something different, can you adjust and keep going with it? And, mm. and that's essentially what happened. It was a, a good thing. Money was great. Timing was good. Lifestyle. It became about lifestyle. What do you want? And then that afforded me to do so many other things, you know, other nonprofits that I opened mm-hmm. and started writing my book. Uh, and then giving time and uh, attention to my three kids and my husband and the church. Hmm. I'm glad you miss- mentioned your book. It's called The Rules of Medicine. Yay! Correct. I brought you a copy. Oh, great. That is <laughs> great. So one of my questions about the book, is it, is this a read for everyone or is this for professionals that's in the field to kind of guide them? You know, it's for everyone. It actually is for everyone. So The Rules of Medicine um, initially was written to help people in the medical profession nurses, doctors, you know, OT, physical therapy, whoever, um, deal with the ins and outs Hmm. of what we go through daily. So it was geared towards that, but come to find out a lot of these are basic common sense things, um, things that anybody and everybody in any profession Hmm. should know. You know, some of them may pertain to to medicine specifically, like empathy. You know, empathy was about me losing my child, my first child, having a miscarriage, and not being allowed to feel because I was a female orthopedic surgery in an all male mm. field. Yeah. And that was uh, one of those things you didn't show weakness, you didn't mm. show tears, you didn't show any of that. So even in that process, there was a nurse that allowed me to have that mm. be the patient, to be the patient and be able to have that empathetic moment of relating to me and with me um, to go through that process. Um, there's some in here that everybody knows. Karma's a bitch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't care where you Definitely are, is. what you're doing in life. Um, but in this was specifically about a patient that was very rude and 
and cruel, and uh, it came back to bite him, you know, that kind of thing. Well, speaking of that, because I was going to talk to you about this, because I really want to know far as what what are you supposed to expect as a patient coming in? Because you all know when you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital, you just, okay, I'm coming to be looked at, and you just expect to be told anything. Mm. How do you know you're dealing with somebody that's actually knowledgeable about what's going on? That's a good point. Um, that's one of the rules, intuition. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's something that's intuitive about what you see, what you feel. Like if it just doesn't settle right with you or you just are not at ease, then that's the wrong person. That's, the, that's not the right thing. Today we have three types of patients. Um, and I say you have the old school patient, you know, whatever doc, whatever you say, I'll do it. I'll, you know, yeah. it's that patient. Um, that's the, usually an older generational type patient. Um, and then you have the <laughs> WebMD doctors that got their own Google MD mm -hmm. that you can't tell them nothing, you mm -hmm. know. So those patients come in, Audrey, I want this prescription, I want this done, and I want it done this way in this amount of time. Well, sometimes that's not realistic, mm -hmm. you know. However, you have to learn how to deal with those patients because those have become the more frequent mm -hmm. patients with, you know, websites and social media and everything else. Everyone has an MD now, you know. Definitely. So, and then there's the in-between patient, which is where I like to gravitate to, which is the patient that comes in somewhat educated. They've mm -hmm. taken an initiative to, to research. Like, I've read about hypertension. I understand what it is. What can I do or what can I not do? And they're willing to have a joint conversation, um, conversation mm -hmm. as well as a joint venture of like this is your health not mm -hmm. mine i'm here to lead you direct you but it's all up to you essentially you know so can i offer you non-traditional things can i offer you medications but can i offer you some holistic things mm -hmm. can i offer you some prayer and meditation you know so it's like you put it out there and if that person is willing to accept give them the options give them the alternatives and most patients will accept that because you're willing to somewhat educate them mm -hmm. um, and those are the best patients to work with but if they come in they've already got an attitude or they've already been hurt or burned mm -hmm. you got to ease into it because mm -hmm. not everybody's receptive you know I, agree. Yeah. I definitely agree because it's it's so many questions that come up and just people feeling like they really didn't get the care that they mm -hmm. were supposed to get let alone play it's sometimes it's a race issue like how do you know if you're dealing with somebody that actually doesn't like you like who wants to deal with man that? they will <laughs> tell you sometimes how about that they will tell you, uh, karma's a bitch is about that patient. <laughs> you know, he basically told me, get away from me, you effing nigger. You know, I'm like, mm. dude, I'm, I'm just trying to help take care of you. It has nothing to do with this color of my skin. But in, in people's minds, because of history uh, and misperceptions and that kind of stuff, it, it, can, it can definitely thwart the uh, relationship. And so in that case, guess what? How, there's lots of other doctors out there who would love to take care of you. I don't have to be that person. Mm. So if you run up against that person, you know, you pro, you know professionally have a good bedside manner, mm. another rule, which is just about being respectful and nice as well. Uh, again, because karma will come back, it you know. <laughs> and then um, push, you know, send that patient to someone else as well as um, I've had, I've had, you know, black patients mm. want a white doctor. I've had, you know, female patients that wanted a male doctor. So it, it goes across the board and it, to each his own. And there's plenty out there. Because it's a lot of stigma when it comes to the color, race, Correct. the type yeah. in the medical field. Yes. Like yeah. when I was growing up, like me personally, like one of the ignorant things that I was, I just knew every person that was uh, Muslim or someone that knew what they was talking about. Like I'm going to that person right <laughs> there. He knew all his medicine. Yeah. He knew exactly yeah. what he talked about. But as time like grew old, like time went on, like I realized like, everybody was just there it's they're almost just like how we are in the culture exactly. but most of their family does deal with the medical field mm -hmm. so them growing up into it going i'm not saying they know more i'm just saying they just been around it yeah right. more and more frequent to it more knowledgeable just the smaller thing mm -hmm. i think also like right now i'm on the navajo nation uh, reservation the largest indian reservation i'm doing a contract there a uh, phenomenal place um uh, I thought black people had it bad. It's like you don't understand destitute until you've been someplace like this. Mm. Uh, it runs like a government facility, VA, because it's basically you know uh, funded by them. But it's that same principle or mentality of if we've been abused or we haven't been taken care of or we've been disparaged someplace along the way, the guard is up. Mm. And I don't care who you are, what you say, what you do. Going in that door, you better be humble, you better be respectful, respectful of their culture, respectful of them by people, that kind of thing. And so I have a good rapport with them. A lot of them will, you know, be almost pleasantly surprised because someone's taking a different approach mm -hmm. to it, that they're actually concerned or, or um, willing to educate them. But for a lot of times, you know, they come in and they're so hardcore, like, 
um, they don't like a lot of white doctors, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or they're very guarded. And I was like, it's a Tuskegee experiment. It's the, you know, it's all of these other things that makes a lot of African Americans not want to go to the doctor. And uh, that's a huge statistic, and that's part of the problem even with our own health, you know, in our system mm -hmm. today. How do we know when we're dealing with an actual doctor that doesn't like to deal with us? Like, is there certain <laughs> signs that we should be <laughs> you know, looking the for? the attitude when you right. walk in the door, well, the eye contact, some people, hey, lack of. Nowadays, they smooth with it. They smile and everything else and be ready to kill you on mm -hmm. the other side of the door. Um, I think if you're getting what you need, if you're getting um, the care and or the information and or the medications and done in a respectful and timely manner, sometimes you won't be able to know that. I mean... Uh, we take the Hippocratic Oath to say that no, there's no bias. Now, I, I'm a big component of talking about racial disparities and uh, healthcare dis you know, bias. Mm -hmm. it's, it's there. It's huge. Uh, and we can't ignore it. And even to the point of the training of the doctors that go into it, if you come from a very elite society yeah. or a privileged background and you've never related to an African-American man that grew up in the hood, then therefore you can't have this um, attitude or chip on your shoulder when you walk in that room because they won't receive it. Mm -hmm. Case in point was um, one of the orthopedic that trained me, you know, was that guy. And uh, it was an older black woman, needed the hip replacement. He was a great bedside manner, talked to her, explained everything to her. And then he basically says, okay, so I've got an opening on Monday and we're going to do this surgery. It was like Friday afternoon. <laughs> and she says, well, well, hold on now, uh, baby. I, I'm going to have to talk to my pastor and uh, <laughs> call my son. And I got to get my affairs in order because in her mind, if something happened and she was going to meet the Lord, mm. she needed to be ready. And yeah. so Monday was too soon. He blew up at her because in his mind, he was doing everything right. And he was offering her something that was great. And, yeah, there was maybe a three-month waiting list to get on his you know, mm. schedule or whatever else. But culturally there was a gap yeah. that he didn't understand and i i understood i'm like yeah she gotta go talk to her pastor yeah, yeah. you know that kind of thing so um, get everything it, right it's just a matter of uh, of training i think a mm. lot of the racial disparity and um bias that's in medicine right now is going to take a lot of training and educational um change mm. that unfortunately the culture that we're in right now that uh there's some people in political positions that are, are flipping the script. And so we're actually losing ground and mm -hmm. we are gaining ground, you know. I definitely agree. Yeah. <laughs> definitely agree. And another thing I really wanted to talk about was, so you got to do an interview with ah, Maya Angelou. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Not only the an interview with her, I was the third last interview and I was mm. not a professional interviewer. So, um, we had, uh, have a nonprofit called Motivating and Empowering Women to Excel, mm -hmm. and we focus on economics, and, you know, health and spirituality. And so she was speaking to the spirituality. She had just written a book um, about, you know, for her son and her only son. But she talked about depression. And so Mental Health Month for Women's Month in May, we were going through that whole thing. We asked maybe several months out. She was $30,000 to interview to have an interview with her, and we, we definitely didn't have it, yeah. you know? so, uh, but God, you know, if yeah. you wait a while, had a great assistant that had some connections, knew the secretary of the secretary of the whoever, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, she, and she was able to get us the interview, she got sick, um, took ill, and canceled the interview, so we just gave up, and mm -hmm. maybe two weeks later, she called, her office called and says, if you're still willing to do the interview, she'll give it to you, you know, basically free, mm -hmm. you guys won't have to yeah. And we're like, what? You know, it was one of those. So we're scrambling and everything else. Um, and I remember sitting, I was actually nursing at the time, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm sitting in my son's room trying to do this interview, tape it, and, you know, be the one man show. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and unbeknownst to me, my husband's at the door videotaping and taking pictures of me, you know, and I was in a mommy mode, but I was talking to one of the greatest and most prophetic women, you know, in our century. Uh, and I was in tears. I was just in tears because she was just dropping knowledge, you know, just dropping knowledge. And oh, you were going to say, how was that it. even like? like it was, just it was overwhelming. It was overwhelming, you know, and stuff. And, and she had a finesse. Like, she had a touch where um, there was one moment I'd ask either a same type of question. You know, I had my list, mm -hmm. and I was going through my list to get the answers. And she answered and had already answered the next question. I wasn't paying attention enough to, to realize it or catch it. And then she's like, no, baby, I've already said that. Now, what you need to ask is, so she did it like a big mama, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to scold you, but edu educate Hip you at you the same time and give yeah. you love. You know, it's like I said, that is a generational finesse that we don't have today. I would say you don't get that you from know. everybody no, no, no. at all. And so that was uh, May, May 4th, and the interview aired on Mother's Day. And then 
Um, two weeks later, she passed away. She mm. passed away. And Nikki Woods. Um, that was a close. Like it was. Nikki Woods was uh, my uh, a real good friend of mine from Tom Joyner Morning Show. And uh, she called me, and I was on call, and it was early morning. She's like, mm-hmm. I'm so sorry. And I'm like, I said, about what? And I still get chills. She's like, I, I guess you don't know. Maya and Jesus passed away. I'm like, what? What? And she goes, I think you were the final interview. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I was like, I couldn't even process. And I had to go into surgery. And so I was taking care of my patients and everything else. And I processed. I'm getting all these phone calls and texts and everything else. And it was like, you, you may have been one of the best interviews with Dr. Maya Angelou. So then it became, how do we capture that moment? and put it, you know, Out not right about way. me. Yeah. It was about her and the images of her. And so uh, Miko Graphics did a great job of just putting pictures of her and two hmm. words, and um, we put it on YouTube. That was just phenomenal. Um, but uh, Robin Roberts was the fa- final interview. She had the actual final interview, like, days before she passed away in her home. Uh. Um, and then um, there was one other interview from Essence Magazine that they did a leadership group by phone with the kids the Sunday after mine. So hmm. those were the final two. I was the... Third final. But that's man, being a but final I'm like, anything. I'm not an long expert you, and yeah. interviewer. That was like, I was just humbled. I was humbled. As long as I got an interview, I'm good. It's the it first one. That would have been good. Phenomenal. And I know, uh, doing. I meant, heard you mention your organization, your nonprofit. Mm-hmm. Y'all have a, a lot of clinics overseas as well, right? Now, the um, New Missions Organization is a, a medical clinic that we built. Um, mm-hmm. New Missions Organization is a nonprofit that partners with churches to mm-hmm. build. Um, church facilities and schools well in in, in Haiti uh, on the Lake and Plateau we partnered with them to do school supplies and that kind of stuff and you know um, send to the schools and when we went to Haiti uh, we were standing on the compound I'm like what is this and it was broke up ground and concrete he says that's our old medical clinic and we haven't been able to rebuild it after um, Haiti, the earthquake in, mm-hmm. in 08 and I'm like wow okay so what would it take and he says about, about $75,000 and I'm like okay we, we can we can figure that out. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't give it to you right now. Yeah, but we can, we get can that. Figure, figure it <laughs> yeah. out. If this is going to service 100,000 men, women, and children on the Legon Plateau that are Haitians that need medical care in a year, we can do this. And so God's Woman Rock was uh, uh, a vision I had that had been going on through our church. Mm-hmm. And it was like, let's focus our attention and let's give to this, this cause. And so, you know, we had a great night and raised some funds mm-hmm. and help build a medical clinic over the next two years, right before Hurricane Matthew hit um, Category Mm. 4 that devastated Haiti. The medical clinic was up and running and did help a Mm. lot of people there. So That's a big thing because, I mean, not just here. You went over and helped somebody else that really needed it. That's what I'm saying. You can't make a plan. That that was never scripted. You have to allow God to, you know, flow through and and let the opportunities come because you never know what's going to happen. You really don't. Yeah, never know. So how did – for, who did you partner with to come up with the, um, the organization? Or is it just something you just thought about and just like, you know, let me just come? Well, our church, the Luke, um, was doing some of these, they call them shoe boxes. Mm-hmm. So the shoe boxes were, you know, they put school supplies, spoons. Do you realize, like, mm-hmm. spoons, a utensil, something that kids can use to eat? But they don't have spoons. So there's like a spoon drive just so kids can have a spoon, spoon. to eat the beans and rice. Pretty much that's pretty much all they eat there. So it was spoons and, like, socks. Um, and shoes, we do tennis shoes. So mm. tennis shoes is a big deal to have a, a new set of tennis shoes that fit your feet. Because when we went there, we realized the kids were grabbing tennis shoes, and it wasn't just for them, it was like for their family members mm. or whatever else, and they would always grab shoes a little bit too large. So they can grow into So they can grow into they were smart. Now, however, now if we had Converse, or there were some Nikes or some Jordans, they were taking them, I don't care what size they were. <laughs> <laughs> they was gone. <laughs> they were gone, they were gone. So it was a, it's a great organization, and their whole thing was Christianity, mm-hmm. you know, to build Christianity, build the school, and that builds the church together. So the principals served also as, as the pastors usually over there. And so my husband would even go over and do international leadership things. Like how do we minister better and more effectively in these churches? Um, because, you know, you know um, the whole voodoo slash. Uh, but, I mean, it's huge. if people did, they. He, uh, not history, but actually did they research? Voodoo is the spiritual growth. It's Hoodoo a, is the one that gets you. It's the same. It's the same type of medicine. So if mm-hmm. it's traditional medicine, it's the Ayurvedic medicine. If it's Haitian medicine or if it's American medicine, in some shape, form, or fashion, when you put spirituality with it, they do flow in different ways. Mm-hmm. They do. You're right. They do flow in different ways. It's what people are more afraid of. Yeah. Of their unknown. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. So you being a doctor get into it. How do you take your doctor hat off at church? 
Oh, okay, that's easy. Because we know you being the first lady. Hey, uh, I hurt my arm the other it day. Does. How did it's it? there, man? They all the time. You know, I was like, I had people pull their shoes off and be like, "Can you look at my toes?" And um, I got this knee and this back and all this other stuff. So um, I have had a great. I'm a great resource to refer out. So I have a good referral base of, of who I send people to. Mm. Uh, and these are doctors that have I know take care of patients and do it very well. That's one thing. Um, but also, I think it's it's uh, it's uh, really important for people to feel that they can access. You know, it's like if I don't know what to do or where to go, why not my first lady right here? And our health ministry is really big at the church. We're big about partnerships mm-hmm. and stuff, too. The only yeah. thing they know is doctor. They understand you're ortho, but they just know doctor. That means exactly. she can do all this. Exactly. And it's <laughs> like, can I get a prescription? No. Mm-mm, no. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it does give that, it lends that whole thing of like, okay, she's not the regular first lady. You may not catch her in a hat. You may not whatever, but usually at least approachable to, to help, you know. You be uh, the first to call. Anything happen, we yeah. need you to come out here. T- uh, email, they will text, they will uh, inbox on all DM, everything. <laughs> I get at least two or three a day. And so I started this, uh, or I uh, bought into a organization called Rodox, which is a telemedicine group because, mm-hmm. I mean, that's what's what it's all about. How can we access healthcare mm-hmm. quickly and efficiently? And so that's Is that the, where they just go online and just write out what's wrong with them? On your phone, them back? man. Rodox. You can literally go in and be like, okay. I think I heard about then, that. Yeah. So it's the largest African-American uh, telemedicine company in the country. Oh, it's an African American company. Mm-hmm. Yeah, predominantly we are probably eighty six percent African Americans. That's pretty dope. Different states. Mm-hmm. That's pretty dope. So Rodox, and and that means I can go on my phone, make the appointment, and see the doctor right here. You don't have to go anywhere. I don't oh. have to park. I don't have to pay. I don't have to go into a building. Well, I don't you have gotta to pay. A babysitter. Yeah. No insurance. You pay. Insurance will be billed, and and nothing that you have to take care of. Now, there's different ones. Some of them will want you to pay a copay or whatever, with a credit card or whatever. But so, how you do when you got to go to labs? You just put the labs in. And you just they send can them? send them, and then they'll send you. Like you just, they'll send it over by. Um, We're gonna make sure you put it. all that information out before you leave, so <laughs> exactly. everybody can get on. Exactly. <laughs> so, with the new wave, how do you feel about CBD? Uh, I'm actually for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's one of those uh, again herbal medicines. You know, what's natural, what God put here is um, useful and we just have to find the uses you know i think we've looked at all the bad uses or whatever got it miss you know misqualified misunderstood through the 60s 70s or whatever else but i do believe it has some uh, medicinal purposes as Mm -hmm. well as helps patients not just with cancer but other aches and pains you know everything in moderation everything in moderation yeah far as um medicine this may be a far-fetched question but far as like medicine do you feel like we have really evolved in medicine or just depending more on technology? Ooh, that's a great question. That is a great question. I believe modest medicine has evolved, but I think technology has transfer, transferred or transformed us to a higher level than we would have been. I think medicine and, and technology have to work together mm-hmm. hand in hand. And actually medicine is a little bit behind technology. Cause I was just, just sitting up here thinking right now, just for us like natural remedies, like back in the day, they actually had natural remedies to cure certain things. So I'm just like, did we kind of lose the touch to actually knowing what's coming from the earth that we can take or, uh, but technology gives us the, I can Google it and I can find out more about it. So therefore it's a, it's a give and take, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What, what am I willing to do? What am I not willing to do? But finding out the information is there for everybody now. Hmm. You know? Agreed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But before we um before we get up out of here, I want you to um give out your information. Well people definitely give out the Road Dog app, all yes, that so people definitely. can get, get in contact with that. Uh your book where people can buy your book. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. seminars, you're speaking to anything. Yeah, I'm a, okay, so I'm Sonia Sloan M D on mm-hmm. all on platforms. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm Sonia Sloan, S-O-N-Y-A-S-L-O-A-N-M-D. Um, and then the rules of medicine.com or Sonia Sloan MD.com. You can find those things out. Uh, and then Rodox.org. You can go in and find a doctor that's in your area, in your state, make an appointment and connect. Man. And then y'all come see us at the Luke and Humble. We're mm. on the north side, the Luke you're kicking it with G on your favorite station. The perfect station. 92 K L Z, the only station with new music, new artists, new sound.